Welcome to the next video in our series about the life of David. Uh, I was asked at the very beginning which portion of David's life I wanted to uh, speak on and I saw the list and picked uh, David sparing Saul's life and at the time uh, it seemed like a great idea and looking at it more deeply now I can see there's a, a lot there that we can learn from and I'm not sure I'll do it justice so this may be something you can look into yourself and and I'll give you a, a few ideas that you can maybe develop further for yourself. The section that we're looking at is found in 1 Samuel in chapter 24 and it says there in verse 1 when Saul returned from following the Philistines he was told behold David is in the wilderness of Engedi then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goats, rocks. And then he came to the sheepfolds by the way, and there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now, David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here's the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand. <clears throat> and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Then David arose stealthily and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words, and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went out on his way. Afterwards, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My Lord, the king. And when, the, and when Saul t looked behind him, David bowed his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against the, uh, my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients say, out of wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you, and see to it, and plead my cause, and deliver me from your hand. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. We have a, a scene here, set not far from the Dead Sea, in a place called En Gedi, which uh, there's still the En Gedi Park there in Israel. And it means the spring of the young goat. We have David hiding in an uh, inner cave, 
Saul going in and falling asleep. And David's men come to him and say, here's an opportunity for us to kill him. David says, no. After cutting off the corner of his robe, his heart is stirred. And Saul gets up and leaves unharmed. David then goes out after him and explains what he has done. And there's a reconciliation between Saul and David. Although they don't go away together to work together, Saul ceases from hunting him for that time. So there's a few things that I want to look at. First of all, I want to look at uh, dealing with the Lord's anointed. Then judgment uh, of God is called upon twice and we'll maybe take note of that. I want to look at God's timing, worldly at men's advice and then actions that have an impact. Okay, so that's the sort of main topics that I want to look at. So first of all, dealing with the Lord's anointed. David was not willing to harm the Lord's anointed. You'll remember, perhaps, if you know the story of David well, that he had been anointed as well by uh, Samuel. So here we have two anointed people. You might not be aware of this, but we as Christians are anointed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, it says there, And it is God who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us, and who has also put his seal upon us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. We as Christians are anointed. And how we deal with each other is very important. Saul could have been killed by David. But David recognised that this was another anointed person. This was another of the Lord's anointed. And he would not turn his hand against somebody the Lord had anointed. Do we do that? Do we turn our hand or our mouths against the Lord's anointed? Do we look to harm other Christians? And I'm not just suggesting other Christians within our own church family, our own local church. Perhaps we do. Perhaps there's somebody in our church that we don't get on with. Somebody that we see as a threat to our position in the church. But guys, we're not expected to hurt them. We're not expected to harm them. We're not expected to seek their disadvantage. We're supposed to build up the saints. We're supposed to strengthen them. We're supposed to guard ourselves from seeking their harm. You'll note that David wouldn't even say a bad word against Saul. He did not accuse Saul of trying to kill him, although he had. Yes, he had done evil to him. But you'll note that David did not hold himself up and say, how dare you? Look at me, I'm, I'm this important person, you seek my harm. No, he points out, he's like, who are you hunting? This dead dog, a flea. He does not build himself up, but caters to Saul's insecurities. David did not say, I am the Lord's appointed. And I will be king over Israel, whether you want it or not. Instead, he lays himself low. He prostrates himself on the ground. So we've looked at dealing with the Lord's anointed. And now we can look at uh, worldly advice. You'll notice that David's followers wanted to take Saul's life. And from a worldly standpoint, that was the right option. Kill the man that's seeking to kill you. But David said no. We have to be careful whose advice we seek. We are not worldly people as Christians, or we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be going to people in the world to point our way. We should be going to the Bible. We should be seeking God's wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1 and 25 says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. 
James 1 and verse 5 says, if, you lack, if one of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. We could read books on management and interpersonal skills. We could seek financial advice from the greatest minds in the stock exchange. But guys, we have a God who is wiser than all. We do not need the world to tell us how a church should operate. We do not need the clever men of this world to tell us what is right and wrong. We do not need philosophers to tell us what wisdom is, for we have the source of wisdom in God. So we've looked briefly at uh, dealing with the Lord's anointed and uh, worldly advice. And now I want to look at God as judge. You'll notice that twice David calls upon God to be the judge between him and Saul. You'll notice that we often want people to look at us and judge us, to be found worthy or acceptable in the eyes of other people. A Christian's view should be very different from that. A Christian should be looking at what God has decreed how God will judge and seek his uh, justice and seek his acceptance. Matthew 25 verse 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you to drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did you, we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these of my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not come to visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will say to them, Truly I say to you, As you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You'll notice it was not big gestures that were done. It was the little things. A cup of water, a visit that was rewarded in this. Yes, God expects great things of us. He also expects us to take time and care over those who have little for themselves, the weak and the lowly. And we do it not to gather strength from other people lifting us up, being seen to be doing it like the Pharisees would, but to be like that widow giving her two mites, all that she had for the service of God. So we've looked at uh, dealing with the Lord's anointed, we've looked at worldly advice, we've looked at seeking God as our judge. And now I want to look at actions that have an impact. You'll notice in our passage that David came out and spoke to Saul and that had an effect on him. 
David didn't know what the effect was going to be in the, at the start. He trusted that God had a plan for his life and he did what he saw was being right. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if a salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it shall give light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We as Christians are expected to act for God. We're expected to act as salt, that preservative. We're expected to stop the world from descending so deeply into darkness. We're expected to be a voice in the world for what is right, what God sees as the right way. But we're also expected to be a light. We're expected to show by our actions what God is, who God is, what he has done for people. Give them light in the darkness. Give them hope in the darkness of the night. Why? Not for our glory. But in verse 16 it says, So that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It should not be for our glory that we operate. It should be for God's. We often act with no hope. We think that our behaviours, our ministry, our church activity is going to have little effect. It's not going to change anything. How can it? We're so small. The world is so dark. Ah, but you'll note that David, though a dead dog and a flea, had an effect on the king of Israel. Acting in the way God expected for David had an unexpected results for David. It changed Saul's heart. And you'll notice that Saul at this point admitted that David was to be king. Although Saul had all the power in this situation, you'll notice that it was the prideful Saul who begged for mercy for his children and his offspring. Occasionally I hear people say, one man with God makes a majority. And that is true. We are not individuals encompassed by more powerful enemies. We are on the winning side. God has already won the victory. Christ upon the cross has assured our victory. But we still have the opportunity to serve. We still have an opportunity to make a difference. We still have an opportunity to reach souls with the great and glorious news of the gospel. We still have an opportunity to minister to the saints, to strengthen the church. Our actions should have an impact in this world. The final thing I want to look at is God's timing. David had been told that he was going to be king. And perhaps he saw he could have seen this situation as the opportunity for him to become king. But you'll notice that David didn't think that he was to take the throne by revolution. It was not a throne to be seized. It was a throne that had been promised by God and it would be given to him. So he had no need to seize it out of his own strength. He could rely on God giving it to him. But it was God's timing, not David's. Acts chapter 1 verse 7 says, Then he, that's Jesus, said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. 
It is not our job. It is not our position to know the time scales of God. It is only our position to trust him, to do what he has told us is right, and to rely upon him. God has said certain things will happen, and so they will. When they will happen is not our concern. That they will happen is. And how we act in the light of knowing these things will happen, that is our concern. Ecclesiastes 8 and chapter uh, verse 4 says, For the word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, What are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing. And the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be. For who can tell him how it will be? You may be going through a difficult time in your life. Trouble may lie heavy upon you, but we have that sure hope that God has spoken. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That does not mean all Christians will be wealthy, all Christians will be healthy. It does not say that all Christians will have whatever their heart's desire is. Because our heart's desire is not necessarily the best thing for us. God has a plan for us. A plan that is for our eventual good. And so we can trust to that, knowing that God's wisdom is greater than ours. So we've looked at dealing with the Lord's anointed. We've looked at seeking God's judgment, not our own and not the world. We've looked at the advice of worldly men. We've looked at the actions that had an impact. And we've looked at God's timings. I hope these things have been of benefit to you. If you like this video, remember to comment, like and subscribe so that you can see more videos. You can search back through our previous catalogue of videos uh, to get more from this series and from others. Hopefully we'll see you again in another video.